Brian Tyler. <laughs> This was not your first rodeo with the mummy. Right. Um, yeah, the, the, the mummy, original mummy for me was definitely Baba Hotep, and it was, it, it was a bit different. It was, uh, you know, what, it, that's one of my all-time favorite projects to have worked on, was Baba Hotep. I mean, Don Coscarelli, I, a huge Phantasm fan growing up, you know, and um, I mean, when he described the movie to me, I, I remember talking to you really early on, too. It was, it's, it's like the impossible movie to describe, you know, like before you yeah. watch it. Yeah. Yeah, we got this movie, you were wondering if you wanted to do it, and it's, you know, it's got like this guy that's Elvis, but he's not. He, well, he is, but he, you know, he kind of has now become an impersonator, but then there's a mummy, and then there's this guy that's thinks he's JFK, but he's a black dude, and like, oh, it was just like, like I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and, but it's, and also, it's, it's quirky and, and, and um, funny, but heartfelt, like, like, you know, we want really an emotional score. What mummy things did you pick up from Bubba Hotep that you could apply to this? Um, you know, uh, I don't know if there was really, you know what, no, that's not true. There's kind of a certain, um, uh, harmonic scale that you tend to go to for Egyptian type music uh, but I never wanted to be overtly Egyptian I don't know if you even pick it up so much in the and the Baba Hotep score there's a bit at the beginning with the voices um, which are me because we had no budget so I did everything I sang all the <laughs> choir parts I just stacked it was like you know that you know that big choir piece where they they come out of the car and all that that's all just me singing and um, and, uh, and, and so, but, but in a sense, that did tie in to one of the main themes, the secret of the mummy theme. Uh, there, you can draw a connection between the two, for sure. So what did, what did the old Universal horror films mean to you, just as a kid, as a genre geek growing up? Um, you know, I, I had seen it out of order. I saw Bride of Frankenstein first. Um, and I loved it, and then I went backwards into Frankenstein, saw Invisible Man, Creature, um, of course, The Mummy, and, and all the music for all of these were really something that, um, that grabbed me, because these movies were really the first movies to um, do actual, like, you know, scary, uh, like, off-putting, unsettling films, like, like the James Dietrich score. Or, you know, um, and so to me, I mean, I was a kid uh, that, that kind of was all over the place. I loved a lot of genre stuff. I, I, w I was a little out of the box. I, I loved old films. It was kind of like, you know, um, and even musically, I was, I, I think you're out of the box automatically. I mean, my favorite two forms of music when I was like a little kid, it was film scores and hip hop. <laughs> and and it, this did not, fit in kind of to my circle, you know? And it was like, what? You know, like I would be like, yeah, I got the T2 special edition, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that, I thought that was, you know, and, and, and I'm, so it all kind of made sense, you know, um, uh, eventually to go into, you know, what I do now, but um, I don't know, it's just, it's one of those things that, um, where were we going with this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I went way off topic, I think. No, it's, it's all good, man. I, mean, you know, and I think the one thing that really you know, struck me again, even as a kid watching those movies on Channel 56, is Creature Double Feature, was just how romantic uh, those scores were back then. You know, oh, the yes, yes. There we go. Um, sure. They, they were very, um, I mean, they were truly uh, using the orchestra in two ways. I mean, there was the unsettling, there is the dissonance, you know, but at the same time, they were thematic. And, um, you know, you, you had great use of strings, you even had some bizarre instruments that were used in some of, the, like in Bride. Um, but, so I went back and looked at all of that. And, and of course, I, I took that all the way through. I, I love horror films, you know? So I saw the different versions of the movie. There's, there's a lot. There's, you know, hand, and there's like, and then there's there's new mummies, and, and you have the Brendan Fraser mummy with Jerry Goldsmith, and the Alan Silvestri one, and and all of those things were hugely important to me to make sure that that I was doing something that connected, but also was new. 
So, you know, I mean, you, you've been doing these kind of major epic scores since Timeline, you know, right from the beginning. But yeah. this is kind of like, you know, Alex, the director, had just done a very small little intimate film called The Pe People Like Us. And this is kind of a movie that put him into this whole other playing field. What was the kind of education uh, just in terms of, OK, this is how you score a film like this? Or <laughs> it's ominous. <laughs> Um, uh, y yeah, I mean, you know, you step into um, anything that has history. I mean, you know, you're talking about, I mean, it's the moment, you know. Uh, y y y for, for me, um, really being cognizant of what came before me is important. And, and, and working on an epic score, like on, on this scale, to me, it, it almost like at the beginning of my career, I did a lot of horror films, and I missed them. But I, I didn't quite have the, the it, it, this movie allowed me to do kind of whatever I wanted in terms of, do you want a choir, do you want this? And, and I found it was interesting to be that, you know, you, there's, there, even if you have access to, you know, a hundred piece orchestra and the huge choir, you, you just do not want to do that for an entire score. I think it becomes very interesting. When, when the scariest scenes came, when, like, for instance, the policemen, right, are under the bridge. Yeah. It goes stripped down. To, it's, it's a broke string section. It's, it's a chamber group with close, you know, really close quarters and singular solo plucks and things on the cello and the bowing, well, there's like solo cello, like bowing in there. And, and that contrasted with that richness of the romantic side of the score, I thought. And, and so the, the epic size, it's like a tapestry, you know, um, uh, but you want to make sure that you just don't try to hit it with epic all the time, you yeah. know? And, and I think that's Alex, uh, this is something he was aware of too. And of course his previous film being a smaller film, he, he, was a, he obviously is very familiar with huge films from producing them, like Transformers and Mission Impossible, and I met him on Eagle Eye, you know, and we'd, we've done a million things in the last 10 years. But, but I think that he was really just, um, you know, kind of leaving it to me to do, because he hadn't really worked this closely with a composer on, on a movie. Even when he does Star Trek with Giacchino and all that, he, 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 he's involved. But when you're directing, it really is another level of responsibility. You know, the one thing that really hit me about this film is that, you know, I think, you know, if I hear an action score or like a Fast and the Furious score, it's like, I know that you scored it. There's like this, what I call the, the Brian Tyler action fandango sound. All right, awesome the Tylerisms that I hear, the, 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 I read about in <laughs> Best of <laughs> Tylerism. And this, this really sounded nothing like you. I right. mean, it, it really, you re, really seem to reinvent your entire action genre vocabulary with yeah. this score. Yeah, it, 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 it's pulling on a lot of things that I love, um, but th like a lot of the action was, um, um, it, 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 was, it was a little bit more like intricate and, and in a way smaller in the, uh, in the, in the details. The, and then, then there would be these big melodies. But, but it, was, it was these melodies were gothic. You know, they're, they're not Thor. It's, it's, um, and, and certainly the action is not what you would call like modern. It's, it's more of a... Um, uh, an, an ode to a time where you could just perform it. Now, for me, um, I wanted to do it, and this was this is tricky when you're dealing with like a, a big studio film, it, it, where you often now you record the score in sections on different days. I don't know, yeah. you know like so you have strings on one day, brass on another day, you know, and then percussion or whatever, and you put them together, and and so they have they can they can mess with it. At the end, it takes the fun out of it. Right, right. So, <laughs> so I, I was saying that that I wanted to do everything live in the room, uh, at one time, where you know I'm conducting and the orchestra is playing, and to the point where we had like a dodic player in the room, which could ruin a take. Mm -hmm. You know, you have someone that would come along, and and you you're talking about instruments that have um, they're bending quarter tones into being whole to whole tone scales and and all this, and it can you know it can but. 
the thing is, is that there's two reasons why I wanted to do it this way, and it uh, was because you have, you, you literally, th there, there is a difference between a brass section playing by themselves and the sound going across the room and hitting the wall, and then coming all the way back and you record that. There's no string players. There's no, one, there's no human bodies to absorb sound and do their thing. Also, the string players create these sound waves. They're flying through the air this way. The brass sound waves are flying through the air this way. They meet in the middle and they do another sound. It's, it's like shifting, Doppler shifting and things like that. So, so if you cannot simulate it just by stacking takes on top of each other. You, in order to get the real proper bi like rich sound, you need those sound waves clashing with each other and it creates a chorusing effect. It's imperfect, right? Oh yeah. And, and so, so this is why we wanted to, to do it. Now of course it makes it more difficult because you know one person, <laughs> you have more of a chance of one person blowing it for the, you know, for everyone else on the take, you know. And, uh, but it's exciting that way too, you know. Um, it's kind of like doing it without a net. And what that does is it, it makes it so you can go when, when I went and conducted it, I, right after I finished, I conducted it in Poland in, in concert. And it sounds exactly, you know, it really, it, it's meant to be performed. It's not meant to be in a computer. Um, so anyway, that was kind of the philosophy behind the whole score. Well, I want to hear some of this, man. Okay. And uh, I want to give a big uh, thanks to Eric Stratman and uh, Backlot Music for providing us with some music-only clips from The Mummy. Yeah. Uh, I hate to sound like Comic-Con guy because it drives me crazy, but no photography and no video oh, stuff, yeah. please. Oh, yeah. do that. I mean, wow. I mean, talk about really knowing how to hit stuff but keeping it within the context of a musical architecture. And then you have this beautiful reveal of Aminette's theme when the tomb comes out of the water. Yeah, the, the I mean, the, the thing about uh, Aminette in this movie that we had to really be aware of was that um, it, 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 it's, it's not just an arch kind of, you know, monster. It's a monster that you're attracted to. She's, you know... Uh, it's like you, you know, uh, the, the, the reaction you have when you see her is like, oh God, run away. Oh no, but when I go, come back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so the theme had to be kind of, an, in a sense, romantic, you know, um, and alluring and, and kind of a siren song. So, you know, I think the, the other kind of interstitial music there was, is more, um, uh, it's you know about the atmosphere and the and the scariness and, and all that. There's a bit of Nick's theme there just for a split second, you know, when he puts down the um, the bags. But that doesn't really become fully a, that theme doesn't come to fruition until later. It's just it's again setting up, you know, themes for later um, as well as just kind of setting the tone. Hopefully. Well, the next we have really plays in the, the, roman the romance, the dark romance of Aminette. It's one of the flashback clips. Actually, it's the first one with Nick. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Uh, it's funny because there, that scene was very different originally. Yeah, I was, I was telling the audience uh, about essentially those flashbacks used to be all through the entire movie. Yeah. And I think they did a pretty good job of putting it right in the beginning of the film. Uh, all yeah. The kind of putting all that stuff together. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. did. Yeah, there was, um, there, there was, they kind of, it was more in this flashback actually where they showed her as uh, princess mm -hmm. and be, to be queen and she was gonna, you know, and the, the entire backstory of why she became the mummy was actually right here. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then they put it at the beginning. But so this, I ended up re-recording this in Abbey Road. Oh, so this is the original version of that scene. So there is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and, and again, I was also talking to the, the audience about how Amon used to, I, for me, she was the most sympathetic character in the film, and boy, they, they, they couldn't really have that by the end. The right, end the yes, you, you really needed to, uh, I mean, you, you couldn't, uh, run from the fact that she is a she's she's alluring 
and she is also irredeemable from what she did, right, uh, with killing the baby and the, and the whole thing. I mean, it was just, you know, you can't come back from that. So, you, you, you know, she, she, it was a revenge thing, and you get why she did it. It's like any origin story of a monster. They have to have some reason that makes sense. You know, it, 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 with the exception of modern psychopath movies, where there's 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 nothing, the kind of um, postmodern psychology, like of a Zodiac killer. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But when you're talking about a monsters movie, you, you need to kind of ride with the the lead character. And I know there was controversy over how much you should like her. You know, um, and uh, and I think I like, for me personally, I like when it's a little bit gray. You know, I, I don't really want my villain so arch and my heroes so, you know, squeaky clean. You, you want a little bit of that. I can relate to both, you know. What was the size of the, of the choir? Oh, uh, the choir? Yeah. Um, I think it was like 90. Wow. Something like that, yeah. And then um, there were soloists in there as well, like there. Um, it was all at Abbey Road as well. Well, so we're going to talk about, okay, how Egyptian do we make this movie right. score? Well, there are moments, you know, um, but it, it was more about writing the themes and more about um, kind of going with the story. I think inevitably you want to feel some of that sand in your toes, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so there, 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 there are certain percussion instruments and there's certain instruments that are Egyptian, but also scale-wise, and I did some quarter tone type of um, music in it as well. That, that, but I mean, it's really blended in. Um, I don't think it's overt. Um, and and you, the, the thing that you wanted, though, is to establish some of that Egyptian thing because when you get into modern day London, you need to bring some of that sand with you, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I, the point wasn't to make Egypt look more Egyptian. When you see the pyramids, you know, right? It was to remind the audience in modern day London that this is a mummy movie, which was one of the real hurdles of the movie in the, the first place. So that was my part of trying to... Now, I mean, I think, you know, when people heard about this, the, the big question was, what is Tom Cruise doing in a mummy movie? <laughs> yeah, is know? he the mummy? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right, yeah. and, and he's actually really fun, and I really had a good time watching him in this. Yeah. But, but how much of it was, you know, your kind of duty and kind of selling him in a mummy movie? Okay, so... the. Uh, Look, I was writing this score before Tom was cast, you know, and, and it, this, was, this was 2015 or something like that, you know, late, it was to the screenplay, when the story was totally different, as a matter of fact. And Nick's character changed, and, and then when Tom came on board, they, they changed it. And then Tom, of course, was involved with the making of the movie, and, and it, it changed too. He, he, was, he actually was taking pains to make him kind of... Um, uh, more conflicted. More conflicted, yeah, and, and had more failures as a human being, right? That's, that's Tom wanted that. And so the, it changed. And so, I mean, do you, you, know, you know what happened. It's like I, I, I wrote this Nick theme back when I was reading the screenplay back in, let's say it was a year and a half ago. And then I was recording the score and we had like a one pickup session at the very, very, very end of the movie. I mean, we're talking, oh, we'll get the end title and like a couple things, you know, it was gonna be a mellow day at Abbey, Abbey Road. And it was on a Monday and, and on Friday night, I was like, you know, and it, it occurred to me, it kind of popped in my head that this new Nick theme you know, and of course, the next theme is in 17 cues. The only reason I know that is because of what came next. Um, it's all over the movie, and I thought this is a better next theme. And, and Alex and I had talked about this because his character had evolved. And, and so we talked, I talked to Tom, and I talked to Alex, and I was like, I think I'm going to try to rewrite all 17 Nick cues between Friday night and Monday morning and get them orchestrated copies for our sessions at Abbey Road. And that's what I did. Because it, 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 it was like letting go of this child that I was like, I, the, the other Nick's theme, I was like, you know, I had lived with it for a year plus. But it wasn't, I, the last second, it was like, you know what? Sometimes last second changes are bad, but on this one, I think this is the right move. 
And so, believe it or not, that's the one that's throughout the movie. It was in this scene. It's all over the soundtrack. And yeah. Anyway. So, so the next big clip we have is uh, one of the action set pieces uh, towards the, the first half of the film, which is the whole uh, church attack and uh, van chase. All right. And again, it really shows how you're writing action differently. And that was one of those ones then though, that weekend that I wrote because that wow. makes it <laughs> Let's take a look. Okay. <laughs> All on paper, by the way. Can do mock-ups and work on that. <laughs> Definitely, we're going for like old school monster. I mean. Clearly, oh yeah, that, that's not modern. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, you know, you, I think the, the the since there is a sense of humor to this. Actually, yeah, I was going to say that you know it's horror. It's you it's, need there, a but it's fun. Yeah, you yeah. need a that that kind of um, ba -da -da -bum, ba -da -da there's kind of a there there's a bit of um, bounciness and also kind of harkening so much back to the. It's almost like when you harken back to older school monster scores back then. Their serious is a little cheeky now, because we associate it with all, like, Rawr! you know, kind of old, like, you know, and, and so when you evoke that music, just like using a theremin for aliens, and you know, it's kind of now a bit of a cheeky thing, you, you know, where at first it was like, ooh, what's that scary sound? Now it's not. so part of doing this is an old school, 1930s style, 1940s style score, a lot of it. Um, in this particular scene, I think it made it so it wasn't taking itself too seriously. But you can see, it's interesting seeing that now, I'm like, whoa, yeah, there, that theme, the, all of the, it's very, the, the themes, like even for the knife, or it sets theme, and the, it, it really helped that there was these clearly delineated themes for these scenes, just to kind of help with the narrative. And it's a real textbook in how to take your music in and out, in and out, and how to, Right, you yeah. don't want to, one of the, really, the follies, if you're wall to wall with all that sound effect, you, you, I mean, the, the, the big joke in there was when he steps on the mummy head and goes, and, and then you, I cut out because Tom kind of, under his breath, goes, eh. <laughs> <laughs> So it's like, da 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 you know what I mean? Like, and if you're just, you know, going crazy through it, and that's why it's really hard to tempt these kind of things. Oh, yeah. Because I know you work on temps all the time, and it's just a maddening because all your stops aren't musical. You, you, there's yeah. no way you can match you know, uh, things like that. So you end up kind of having to layer, like, wall to wall it. Right. And then to you have point. to get the director used to, we're going to bob and weave. Yeah. Well, let's continue with this. Actually, probably the moment where I felt the most sympathy for Aminette is in Ah, uh, yes. When, yeah, she's... It's funny because I scored that scene two different ways. I remember, and that was the much more atmospheric way. It was um, uh, where originally I did an all orchestral kind of thing, and then we kind of wanted to make it a little bit dreamy. That was the thought from yeah. Alex, and so um, it, it it got that way. But yeah, you definitely. I mean, you know, you got you got this troop of, you know faceless, armed people jumping out of a van and shooting harpoons at someone, you know. You feel like, that's not nice. That's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a tricky balance, you know, because you still have to keep her, okay, she's still the main villain, but you have this other group that may be even worse. I mean, I have to get this off my chest. I think one big reason I really enjoy this film as well, it's like Life Force with Tom Cruise. Totally it's Life Force, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah, obviously that's later, a great reference. later in the film you get into Almanac going crazy in London. You've got like zombies overrunning the place, double deckers. No, like, I know. I, where, where's Steve Rails back? I mean, you know? totally. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it definitely harkened back. Uh, that was there was a couple references. Dad, American Werewolf, and all that. You know, we. we... Now you know the, the film is you know it's done when it's done over here, but overseas it's it's kicking ass. Uh, I, yeah, I mean it's yeah. it's so it's so crazy. You know, I I talked to. Tom, right around, like, uh, I think it was the Sunday when we knew the numbers. And he actually, he was just chiming in. He saw the performance of The Mummy in Poland that we did. And he was just chiming in. And we had a little chat. Um, and, and, um, and then I, you know, he's just, he was like, 
good mood, everything was cool, and all I saw was the domestic returns, and I'm like, well, it's fine. It's fine, but I was like, you know, I was disappointed that it wasn't, you know. But, you know, um, you, you always do your best, and you, you just put your foot forward. And then I look at Variety, and it shows um, global box office, biggest Tom Cruise opening ever. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so it was kind of, and it's interesting, and I remember talking to some of the people in the movie, and Tom included, and Alex, and there is something about um, making a movie for everyone, and, and you, you, you make it for yourself, and you make it for everyone. It's not a United States thing. I mean, we all, I, I mean, it's a little meta, but, <laughs> meta, but it's maybe a little peace Nikki, but we all breathe the same air. We're on this globe, and we're, we're you know, it doesn't matter, you know. I, to me, it's it's like um, uh, the, you know we live in countries and we have invisible borders that we draw on maps. But in a sense, I'm not even sure why they, it's broken down. Like, well, you you did well internationally, but the domestic return. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, well, it's just all one thing. I mean. It's not like we're on five different planets, you know. <laughs> we're just, we're all breathing the same air. So it's, it's interesting to see. And when we went on, we kind of did this little tour where I was out. I did the concert out there. And then I went to Paris and England and Greece. And we did different premieres. And, and Universal was great. They, they had me come along. And they really put the music forefront. All the premieres, they had the music playing as Tom would come out and do a thing. And it was interesting to see how there and then do the New York one. There's a huge difference, like when we were in France or when we were, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it was so much of a bigger phenomenon there. And you could tell being there. And, and, and film music is also different there in terms of how it's perceived. It's, it's much more, here it's a little more niche, there it's, it's almost like, even the more Eastern European you go, it's almost like pop music. Like it, you're, it's bizarre. I'm, I'm not used to getting recognized at the mall, you know? <laughs> and that's what would happen there. It was like, you know, it's like kids that, you know, just hanging out, these skateboard kids, you know, coming up to me. I'm like, wow, how do they know this? It's just, it's a different world. So I think certain movies will do better internationally, whether it's Tom or, or it, not Tom. I think The Mummy would be something that translated. Um, but um, And it's certainly, you know, not the end of the dark universe because these movies are going to keep on going. You know, maybe they'll learn lessons or whatever yeah. and apply them to the, uh, to the next ones that they do. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing is you don't want to overcorrect. I think there, there is a phenomenon uh, that also has a lot to do with what came right before you, you know. Six days before was Wonder Woman opened. Yeah. You know, and then you have... It, 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 it's such a it's such a weird like there's no particular formula, um, and I always worry about overcorrection, you know. Um, but um, as long I th I think the idea the the music they're very behind of keeping the music as thematic, orchestral, and um, and kind of old school, old yeah. school, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, also I want to give a shout out to a really excellent documentary, even though they cut me out of it. Uh, called <laughs> called Score. It's right. playing at the Arc Light right now. It's a wonderful, wonderful documentary about yeah. the music, and you're uh, definitely a featured person in it. Yeah, yeah, that's a. It's cool. I just saw it. You know, I, I was at the premiere, and that was great. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to see just kind of the process of these, you know, different composers and how there's similarities down to the point. And one at one point, there's a. I'm talking about how. It's the, the other themes of John Williams that make, you know, where I was talking about Superman, I think, at one point, and saying how the Krypton theme is what sets up the main theme, and the, we would not know the march as what it is if it wasn't for Krypton. And then, like, two seconds later, Hans said it was the same thing. <laughs> you know, it, it, and so it's, it's cool to know that there, this, you know, especially as all of us being film music fans and lovers of it, I mean, I grew up listening to music, and I would have loved to have seen this movie about all the film composers that I grew up with, you know, which they actually do cover, yeah. you know. I mean, there's Bernard Herrmann and John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith, and they talk about everything, you know. But um, but certainly those were my heroes growing up. Those were my, you know, I, I had, I mean, I literally made my own stickers on my notebook. They were like, it's like, Jerry Goldsmith. <laughs> and like, and like, I like have it, like, you know. And we're, <laughs> It was it was weird. <laughs> well, and talking about fans, I want to open this up to questions from the awesome people here. Uh, questions for Brian Tyler, anyway. 
Yo. Hi, Brian. Uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out here today. Sure, thank um, you. So talking about old school, I know that Universal also recruited you to compose the longer version of the fanfare for the 100th anniversary. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how that came about, where your inspirations were for that? Yeah, that's that's where my the a good omen of putting Jerry Goldsmith on my notebook came true. So Jerry Goldsmith wrote the original bah, 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 kum, kum, theme, and when it was a hundred year anniversary um, uh, Universal, they did the new logo, and and so they brought me on, and they wanted me to kind of I wanted to honor the Jerry theme, and also there had never been a, like a longer sweet version of it that with it had sections and you know uh, d different movements to it. So that was really cool. Now the thing was is that Universal, it, it was interesting because I was doing a movie over there and um, I had offhandedly was just talking about some of the relationship that Jerry and I had. You know, and um, you know, I'm obviously a huge, huge fan and a respecter of him. And we also worked on so many uh, pro uh, movies and projects where he did the original, and then I ended up. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, timeline. Many, time, well, yeah. and for timeline, of course, he scored it. Yeah, that there, yeah. <laughs> that's how we met, and and that was I was awkward because you know you're you're I'm filling I was replacing the score and. And he's my hero. It's just bizarre, you know. And I didn't even want to hear the score because I know I just cry and I'd be like, I can't do better. <laughs> but I saw him at the Star Trek uh, Christmas shindig, and all was forgiven. Anyway, so yeah, I, I had because I was scoring Star Trek. So he did Star Trek the movie. I did Star Trek the show. I did Aliens vs Predator. He did the original Aliens. I did Rambo. He did the original First Blood. I did you know the timeline. I mean, it just goes on and on. Mummy. He did the Mummy. It, like it's it's crazy how much we've just accidentally been connected. So that was really the thing that capped it all off for me, and I was glad I did. It was a huge honor. And I hear it all the time. I mean, every time I see a movie from Universal, there's no way I can get away for myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? If I want to. I'm on a plane, anywhere. It's like, they do so many movies, and here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Questions, anyone? Good question. Uh, you said that uh, you did it from a, like a Friday night to a Monday, where you did 17 with you. And, uh, and you did it all by paper. Was that you just go on the piano? Did you have a guitar with you? Or you yeah, it was, it was scary. No, yeah, it was literally on paper. It, I wrote the theme on piano. Uh, I pretty much only had the piano at, the, at that stage. Um, the, I played it on the phone for Alex on the piano and Tom, and they loved it. And, and, uh, and so I basically, they're like, okay, I, I don't know, I guess, we, look, we trust you. Just, look, we have this other thing if we really need. I think that was in the back of their minds. They didn't say that. But they're just like, we'll trust you, we'll go with it. And um, it was literally going down and writing it on, like, just like, okay, clarinet, you know, and, um, okay, it's okay. It's like really, really old school and just, it's in your head, and you're hoping that when the orchestra plays it, what's in your head translates. Because there is, there's a variance. That's, you find out things when you're mocking up, like, whoa, that, that's not right, that octave's ridiculous. You know, even in your brain, for some reason, it sounded good. But for whatever reason, it, 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 we had no time on that day to like, fix things. It was like trying to do 17 cues and a 10 and a half minute end title and all this in one day is insane. Luckily, we weren't doing it like stacked. We were just recording, but um, but it, it really turned out that the, all the accidents where I hear something and I'd be like, oh, that's different than what was in my head a little bit, like a, a harmony part, just the timbre of the harmonics on the strings versus just playing very high. All these little tiny differences, I liked. So I think it improved. The accidents improved it, but it was really hair raising. It was super close and. And my the uh, the the copyists and orchestrators hated me because I was doing this. I mean, it was like you know, it was Sunday night, and I was you know, I was still writing maybe six more cues, you know, still writing them, and it's like the next morning. So we were literally the copyists were going while the session was going, we're printing, and you know, in the next room. I mean, it was like at a certain point we caught up with them, and there was no more music. And uh, we would wait for the sheet music to just be brought in physically, you know, ink wet. 
Wow. Who is nuts? <laughs> ah, Evan. How you doing? Hey, buddy. <laughs> what would you say you've learned doing studio films that you didn't possess as a film composer or composer doing independent films? Ah, uh, yeah. A film composer needs to possess. For sure, there's two. I think there's two answers to that. One is that the um, the t the difference between the studio films and the independent films is is very distinct. But I think, and I'll go to that second. The thing that I found was even more of a hurdle was going. How do you go from independence to studio films? It's almost the big as big of a jump as going from no films to independent films, and because. They, there needs to be something, the vast majority of independent films um, are, are, are like, they're, they're good as a composer to get other independent films. It's very difficult to do one that a studio says, we're going to trust you with this gazillion dollar movie. Because the, 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 the amount that's on the line and shareholders and stuff is just crazy. <laughs> um, and, and, and for me, I, um, it, I kind of just got lucky. I did Frailty and and William Friedkin loved Frailty, and he was doing The Hunted, he was directing that. And Sherry Lansing, who William Friedkin was married to, is president of Paramount. So when he says, I want to use this guy, that's this young dude that's done some independent films for my gigantic studio film, we got the green light. So it was just a, it was a kind of a bizarre circumstance. But then once you get there, boy, things change. It's like, wow, the number of people that approve themes uh, and need to write off on it is just enormous, it, you know. And and to think when you're when you're talking about, we, let's say we talk about melody, and we're like, oh, what do you think of this melody? Between composers and musicians, you you would find arguments, and these are the people that actually know how to do it. When you're talking about the director who has his own vision, four five producers that all kind of they all have their little infighting. Then you have the studio executives. And then maybe someone that's from uh, distribution or and marketing and, and also they all have these different opinions about what music should do, and about half of it is just not applicable to reality, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but you need to kind of learn to navigate the waters of um, director says he wants something distinctly different than what producer wants. And they both say, I'm in charge of the film. You do what I want. I want it. I mean, as much as a, I want a, a uh, metal song, I want a waltz. Like, you get things that are, like, completely. I got a note like that, actually, one point on this, by the way. It was like they wanted a, a Metallica type of thing for a thing. That was the note. We do Metallica. And then the other side was Bernard Herrmann. <laughs> so you have to do it so you convince both sides that you You've done, you, what you do is write for the film to help them, help the movie, and then you put it in a way that shows that you have, you've internalized the note and Metallica does use, the, you, I found that, well, they actually use a, a diminished, you know, the, I found a kind of a similarity between Psycho and, <coughs> and Metallica. <laughs> and, and so harmonically, it, it fit both. Um, so those are the, the, the tricky balances that you have to do outside of writing the music um, and you find that there's this whole other aspect to your job that you, you, you did not even know was there that is only on studio films. <laughs> and that answers. Uh, you, uh, do you have any thoughts about how it was like working with Bill Paxson, the director with Frailty? Oh, God. I mean, Bill was amazing, a good friend. Uh, Bill, it's like one of those things. If Bill... Uh, he kept getting cast in roles that he couldn't turn down, right? You know, and he had cool shows on HBO and all sorts of things as well. And he, he's a great actor, but I think his best talent was directing. And there was so much more there. It's a shame that he passed away for so many reasons. He was a great guy, great friend. But at the same time, I felt that he was so distinct. To be able to direct Frailty, which is great really movie. great gothic thriller, and then turn right around and do Greatest Game Ever Played, which is like beautiful turn of the century drama, true story. I mean, they could not have been more different, and both are two of my very best films. And, and such a musical guy. And, and here's something else. He, working with him was awesome because 
he liked the, this Nick theme. His way of previewing the score was me sitting at the piano. That was it. And then we would go and I'd conduct it. But he was old school. He, he knew it. He's like, that mel he, he was so melody based. He's like, you've, you've nailed it, Brian. You cracked it if I do. He knew. Like, I, he could tell if I was off or I was on from the piano, which was great. So, well, Miss Bill, for sure. Yeah, Bill. Marcus? Hey, what Yo. made you uh, come up with such a driving, pulsing score for the Borg episode on Enterprise? <laughs> Borg. Uh, I love, well, okay, so I'm a giant trekker. I think everyone knows that. Um, and. Uh, I always felt that the Borg were the, the most menacing speaking uh, alien villains. I, I would say the alien is the most menacing over it. It's just so unpredictable. But the Borg was just, just to just as a relentless nature. You know, their mantra, of course, you know, resistance is futile. They, they, it's just, they're, they're just motherfuckers. They're just like, you know. And so, so I wanted to have, then we used some choir for that, actually, um, to give it kind of a, a, a otherworldly nature, but this driving, you know, relentless um, mode was really, I think, the, the, just represented the freight trainness of them. They just did not, like, it's like a freight train when it's cruising along, it doesn't look at traffic and kind of make stops or anything. They're not either. They're just like mowing down people, destroying worlds. <laughs> they're just like, Mer, you know, they're not worried about anything. So there, there's no, and in a sense, the, the metaphor sticks is that they're, they're relentless. So, awesome. yeah. Uh, hi, Brian. Hey, buddy. Um, one of my uh, favorite pieces by you is, ironically, not a piece of film music. US Open theme. Oh, thanks. And I was just wondering, um, how did you approach writing that piece of music? Because you obviously didn't have a picture score, so. <laughs> no. So, like, yeah. how did you feel about what were your inspirations and how did you feel about doing that? Yeah, that, and that, that piece is like eight minutes or something. And, and it was cool because that was also a really old school method. That was on paper, and it was just going through themes and kind of setting up and trying to. To, to, to come about with something. Now, I didn't do it in a vacuum. I, I started writing a vacuum and the main melody was, a, I just kind of did it with nothing. And then I was like, you know what, I, I, gotta, I gotta be inspired. So I actually watched the Tiger Woods, um, uh, oh, the, his, his great, you know, the, the one where he does that. Um, and I forget which open it was when, when he made that incredible putt. And, and I watched, I, I got a hold of it. Instead of the highlights, I watched the actual just footage from it, and they were luck they, I was lucky enough they sent it to me, even following hit, just him around, and him waiting for other golfers, and, the, and the, kind of the stress and the whole thing, and I thought, wow, this is like a whole dramatic back storyline that you almost don't get as much when you're just watching it, because they tend to just go with whoever's on the most important hole, and all. so it, to me, it was like, there is drama to this. There's like disappointment, and there's moments, and then it ends triumphantly, but I really needed something. In a way, I guess I'm just a born film composer because I'm impressionistic. I wanted something to write to. And so that was, that's what I did, you know? Well, cool. Um, you seem to be getting a lot of big assignments and doing a lot of action films where earlier on you were doing horror. One of the scores I liked by you best was for the small film Standing Up. Oh, you yeah. Occasionally for something like that for a breather. Oh, all the time. Yeah, that uh, kind of there, there was a few in there around the same time. Truth was another yeah. one, um, and um, yeah, I, I I love dramas. I, I you, you want to change it up, you know. And I'm lucky that even these big action films kind of have nothing to do with each other so much in terms of music. You know, going from Power Rangers really didn't sound anything like Mummy. Didn't sound anything like Fast and Furious. They're just different. Mm -hmm. Just Tonally, you can't even use the same scales. It, uh, but um, so you, so I've been lucky in that way. But I could see how it could very easily be a much different thing, where you're doing the same kind of thing over and over, which would I couldn't do it. I would just turn down stuff. But in in the in between time, I kind of have to, in a sense. Now it's I get asked to do movies way ahead of time, and you work. You built a, a group of friends that are directors. And they kind of tell you what's up, and you you do those movies. These this is your this is you know this is your squad. You know uh, you, you want to continue on with them, and so it's almost regardless of what they're doing. 
if I have the time, I'll work with my very good friends that are directors. And it's up to them in a way, too. Um, I do have some things coming up where they come to me that are very different. Um, I'm doing a, a, a romantic comedy coming up. I'm doing uh, in the next in this next year. There's a bunch of different, very, very different things I'm doing. A, a really old school kind of fantasy film that's that's going to be really interesting. I'm not saying what any of these are, as you can okay. tell. Me. <laughs> uh, but but the, the, um, and and standing up, which was a really a, a really beautiful drama about two kids, you know. Um, but DJ Caruso directed that. Who directed like Triple X, you know, the Xander Cage movie and Eagle Eye and so and Disappointments Room. And so I've done all of his films since we met, save one, I couldn't do it. But um, so in a sense, that's really the great thing is when a director does something completely out of the box. I mean, I, early on in my career it was the same way. Greg Yatanis directed this movie Plan B, which is a comedy, it was all big band score. It's jazz, all jazz. And then um, we, and I was doing jazz scores for some reason that year. I did last, yeah, yeah, Big Empty, yeah. Uh, Last Call. I was doing jazz score after jazz score after jazz. Uh, so I was like the jazz guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then Greg got Children of Dune as an assignment to direct. And they're like, do you think you know how to do this stuff? You're kind of a jazz guy. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, then, and, and of course, it was because of Greg saying, no, 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 He's, he can do this. He can nail Children of Dune. He, he read the books and he, when he was a kid. And, and they, we had to kind of convince Disney that I could do Children of Dune, which of course now you look back, it's like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like the one thing that actually ended up being that stuck with me early on more than any other score. Yeah, great, great miniseries too. Um, um, so um, what's your approach in terms of um, tempo? Whenever you're scoring, what's your approach? What do you look, you know? Yeah, I mean, tempo, I... I I'm notorious for changing up tempos, um, but I think that's kind of because I mean my first instrument I was a drummer, you know, and so I, I think the idea for me there's there's one thing that I found that psychologically, it's a psychoacoustic kind of mind Jedi mind trick, which is when you're scoring these action sequences, sometimes in a Fast and Furious movie, there's 17 minutes, you know, you 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 want to get faster as you go. That's the natural reaction. But if you really want to get faster, it's so over that amount of time, it's so gradual, you don't feel it. And so what I would do with the tempo, for instance, in that sequence, uh, uh, situation, I would ramp up the tempo so it felt naturally. I wouldn't worry about it. I would just start ramping up and it would feel more exciting. And then I found if I pretty much multiplied where I was at by about a third, basically making your eighth nose triplets, <laughs> It's slower, but sounds faster. So you can downshift the tempo. So you go up, yeah. you go, so you're going dun 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 You're slower, but it sounds faster. And then you start, then you, you, you do it again. And you can, can it almost is that trick of where you, you, you hear the, the, I forget the right, what it's called, but it's basically like a Mobius strip of sound. You, you, you're continually rising, even though people drop off and come back down and go up. So for tempo, in, at least in action, yeah. I found that you had to be really smart about doing it so you, you, you feel like, wow, that was a 17, 20 minute sequence, but I still felt I was revving up the whole time. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. So, so you can't just give us any hints. Any I know. That's coming yeah. Well, yeah. I'm trying to think, how do I put this? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're going to be excited about it. I, <laughs> I am. I'm really excited. Well, I want to give a, a huge shout out to uh, Taylor White at Creature Features, uh, Nikki Walsh and Mike Noblick at Backlot Music, Eric Stratman and Brian Tyler. Thank you so much for Taylor's joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming out.